All right, thanks for waiting with the technical difficulties, and we'll get started. My name is Kent Graziano, and I'm here to rant this morning on worst practices in data warehouse design. I've uh, been giving talks for quite a while, and instead of doing the top 10 best practices this time, I figured I would, uh, to this group, it was appropriate to talk about the, some of the worst things I've seen recently, and it's actually recently, and see if you guys have the same experiences. So this is going to be a combination of a rant along with a quiz for you guys to see how much you know about data warehouse design, see if you see the same problems I see, and maybe you'll see some problems that I didn't <coughs> see. So uh, there will be no Q&A because I expect you to participate during the talk, all right? So let's go. Let's see. So we'll do you know standard agenda stuff. A little bit about me. For those of you who don't know me, I am an Oracle Ace director. I've been working with Oracle products. Uh, I need to update the slide. It's actually 25 plus years now. It's an old, old number there. I am a member of the Boulder BI Brain Trust. I've spent you know over half of my career working with data warehousing. Uh, I co-authored a book with Bill Inman back a long, long long time ago um, and that's what got me started with data warehousing was actually working with Bill um, past president of the Oracle development tools user group Odie tug and the Rocky Mountain Oracle user group and been involved with user group stuff for pretty much as long as I have been involved with Oracle all right shameless plug I have a ebook out there checklist for doing data model design reviews it's not specific to data warehousing but it is about doing reviews on data models, both logical and physical. And it is now available in Spanish, thanks to uh, Gallo. Where are you, Gallo? Right there. Um, my buddy Gallo from Austin, Texas, who kindly helped me and translated that into Spanish. And we put it out actually on Kindle last week, just before the conference. So if you know anyone who speaks Spanish who would like a, uh, a book actually in Spanish, uh, it's out there now. If the translation is wrong or sounds stupid, that's his fault. <laughs> Just saying. I do not speak Spanish. All right, so just to get an idea of who's here, how many of you would consider yourselves data modelers or architects? Data architects, specifically. A couple of you. OK. How many of you are project managers? Not too many of those. That's good. How many of you are IT managers? Not too many, okay, that's good. DBAs, that's like most of you, right? Okay, good. And developers, the other part of you, good. How many of you have less than one year of data warehousing experience? Okay, good, well hopefully this will keep you from making stupid mistakes for the next 10. One to five years data warehousing, okay? And over five years. Okay, so all of you I expect will hopefully agree with me on some of this stuff and tell me where I missed the boat. All right, keep me honest up here. All right, so a little bit about the backstory. This is real life, okay? Figured this is a good place to do it. I can tell you guys about what's happening in the real world. This is not theory. I'm gonna show you stuff that actually has happened to me, what things I've seen and what I've had to do. So we're talking about a metrics data market. So I'm not talking about a huge enterprise data warehouse today. Normally I do. Not a corporate information factor. I'm talking about the tail end of it a data mark that somebody's built specifically for metrics. All right, it was outsourced from my client. They outsourced it to a firm that somebody told them knew how to do this sort of stuff. The POC worked great. 500 records were loaded in the fact table. 
in the real world, over 100,000 rows, millions of rows in some cases. The first time we ran it, the DBA canceled the, the load after it ran for eight hours because it filled up the temp space on the Oracle database. He had 665 gigabytes of temp space. It completely filled it up. Okay, think something might be wrong with this. There's so many things wrong, I don't even know where to begin. Um, so I'm gonna begin. All right, so the DBA said there was too many parallel sessions running. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, too many partitions on the fact table. Okay. The load included a select star in the process. It was all loaded using SQL. SQL and views had select stars and select distincts against very large source tables. I heard them whining about it and it's like, okay, yeah, there's something seriously wrong here. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is because I'm a data modeler, is show me the data model. There isn't one. Really? <laughs> you outsourced this and did not get a data model delivered as part of the deliverables. Great. So give me access to the database. I went and reverse engineered it with SQL Developer Data Modeler. So the diagrams you're going to see are from SQL Developer Data Modeler. Um, I'm going to look at the design, and as I said, yeah, yikes. Now, it's not as bad as it could be, but, you know, it's, there we go. So, my email to management, I did a little review and said, I put my money where my mouth was, is I was probably risking my contract, because um, I'm not quite sure who decided to hire the folks that did this. So, in general, the designs of both the source star scheme and the target reporting table do not conform to the best practices from either an Oracle tuning or data warehouse design perspective. <clears throat> My only conclusion is that the folks who did the design were not well versed or experienced in designing high performance, high volume data warehouse designs on Oracle. They're idiots. Some of the omissions are so basic as it is hard to comprehend how this could have been considered a completed system. <laughs> yeah. You want to be on the other end of that? <laughs> and this was actually over a course of two emails. I sent this off to the manager because he said, you know, okay, well, what, what's wrong? And then he said, can I forward this to our VP? <laughs> sure. Knock yourself out. And they did use this then to go back to that vendor and say, um, you're not done. And we're not paying you any more money until you are done. Um, took a while to get them to come back and fix it. But anyway, so let's start off. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, MU order fact. This is a fact table. Just a fact table. This is it, okay? This is a SQL developer data modeler. It will show you everything about the table when you reverse engineer it right. Who wants to go first? Can't hear you. Well, it's a fact table, so we won't kill them too much on normalization, but yes, there is some denormalization in there. What? Uh, let's see. Well, actually, this is one of the really bizarre things about it. They had naming standards, but they didn't make any sense, because I thought the same thing, too. It says visit code, location code, patient code, but they're all number 19. So it turned out they were surrogates from the dimensions, but if you just look at the naming standard, you're thinking, yeah, they're using natural keys. But they were actually using surrogates. I've never seen anybody use an integer surrogate key and call it a code. But, dope, yes, got those. Anything else? What? No primary key. Okay, heard something else. Can't hear you. Yes, there are some denormalized dimension columns in the fact. Yeah, all these var chars. You got order type, order type MU. I'm not even sure what the heck that is. Uh, I'm not test category, really. <coughs> order processed mode, order status, var char 255. I don't think we can aggregate that. Just saying, I'm not sure. Anything else? Okay, well, all right, here we go. All the columns are optional. 
a fact table, everything is optional. All the dimensions, all the metrics. Even the stupid denormalized columns are optional. Okay, so what's supposed to be in this table? So remember, I'm coming in, I'm a data architect, and they said there's a problem with this thing. So I look at the model, there's no information here to help me at all. <coughs> the measure is optional. Uh, in case you couldn't find it, down here midway, ord count. I assume that's the measure. It's a number. The word count is in there. Maybe? Yeah, I don't know. Thinking that's it. The metadata columns are optional. Down here at the bottom. I'm guessing DW ETL created by. I think that's maybe an ETL metadata column. Data warehouse created this row. DW rec loaded date. Okay, DW load run ID. Okay, source CRC key, CRC adder. Those are all metadata columns. They're all optional. <coughs> of course, the answer to that is what? It's all in the code. Right? Uh, normally I hear it's all in Informatica or ODI that we've enforced all this, but this was all written actually with SQL insert statements. Right? That apparently weren't tested. Extra bar chart columns, which you called out earlier, those are the denormalizations. No primary key. Now there's lots of arguments on whether you should have a primary key in a fact table or not, but I don't believe there should be a surrogate primary key on the fact table, but there ought to be something making sure you don't enter duplicate rows, like a combination of the dimensions, maybe. Right? No UK, no unique key constraint, so there's not even something else other than a primary key there to prevent us from loading duplicates. If we ran the same insert multiple times, we would get duplicate rows in this. Because there's, again, it's just a SQL statement that says insert into MU order fact, select from, and then there's a really, really horrendous select statement. If we ran that twice, it would load duplicate rows. There's nothing here to stop it. Now, of course, we couldn't run it twice because it didn't even run once. It was, you know, it filled up temp, so I guess that, that fixes it. No foreign keys at all. This is an Oracle database. So what do we know about foreign keys and the optimizer? Right? Now there's lots of arguments from ETL people saying, oh, foreign keys slow down my load. Okay. But you can drop them and rebuild them afterwards. You can make them disable, no validate, disable, no validate, rely. Tons of options. So again, no information here on that's going to help the optimizer in querying it should we actually ever get the table loaded. Um, there's no way to there's no way to optimize it. No indexes. I have seen cases where people came and put a unique index rather than a constraint on a table, but there's not even any indexes. And like I said, this is SQL Developer Data Modeler. If there was indexes, not nulls, foreign keys, primary, it would all show up in this diagram. Okay, so so what? It's a table without all this stuff on it. It worked fine for 500 rows because they were doing full table scans, right? You didn't need any indexes. Ran great, that was the POC. No clues for the optimizer at all. No clues for the customer. Remember, this was something that was outsourced and it was delivered. And then we have a team inside the client that has to take it over and a DBA who has to now make it run. There's no, nothing in the metadata to even give them a clue as to what the design concept was. We don't know what the intent is. The only way to find some of these answers was to do a bunch of data profiling, which I did do uh, at some point, just to say, well, really, are all these things actually optional? Well, no. Well, you know, select, count, where, null was zero in many cases. No UK or PK, so yes, we could get duplicates loaded. Um, and no foreign keys, which means what? There was no enforcement, so you could load the fact table with dimension keys that didn't exist in the dimension. So what I called it was lazy design, right? Worked fine for the POC, whipped it out fast. Everything looked good. Never went back and looked at it. And part of it, and again, this is one of my other little pet peeves, is the fact that nobody asked for a data model, not even a, di a diagram of any kind. Because if you go and pull something like this into any 
data modeling tool, whether it's SQL Developer Data Modeler, or Erwin, or Embarcadero, or even Toad, right? Or Visio. When you suddenly see on the screen a bunch of tables with no connections, then somebody's immediately going to say, well, how are those things related? And so if you'd at least looked at it, you would say, well, maybe we should do something. So to me, again, they're being lazy. All right, next one. What's wrong with this? This is a dimension, patient dimension. Okay. Anybody want to go? Come on, wake up there. It's not that hard. Be brave. Be brave. Gave you all the answers in the last one. What? Do you see a star next to that primary key column? Everything is optional, including the primary key. How can that be? How is that possible? It's insane, totally insane. Again, everything is optional. Um, the, the naming standard there, look at the first two columns. You got patient code and patient ID. Patient code is a number 19. Patient ID is a bar chart 50. They had stand, naming standards. I could give them that. At least they had naming standards and they were consistently inconsistent. And then some of these other codes are, yeah, a lot of bar chart 50 there for codes. Um, yeah, and then there's all of the uh, metadata columns again. So yeah, all the op all optional columns again. But uh, we do have this time, we do have a primary key. And the thing down at the bottom, those are actually indexes, so the little triangle or um, diamond and data modeler is a symbol for an index. So we got, we have a primary key index on patient code. We have an index of some sort on patient ID, and we have another index on patient code and patient DOD. DOD is date of death. It's a healthcare system. <laughs> DOD is date of death, DOB being date of birth, which is up near the top, right? So primary key and the metadata, again, are all optional. So we're back to what we're we really trying to do here. No unique key, so once again, we can load duplicates. We can put the same patient in here multiple times. I'm not even sure how this happens. I didn't think Oracle would let you do this. You can't declare a primary key constraint on an optional field. So some weird artifact happened here. I realized that when I was writing this up. It's like, how the heck did that happen? How do you declare a primary key constraint on an optional field? That's not actually possible in Oracle. All right, so no clue on the business key. So is that a type one or a type two slowly changing dimension? One, maybe. It's got a sur it looks like it's got a surrogate key, but. But patient ID, which is also oddly indexed, maybe that's the natural key, right? So what, do you, so what do you do for type two slowly changing dimension? You put a surrogate key on it, and you have a natural key, which consists of the, a data attribute and a date. Well, there's, well, pretty sure that the date of birth and the date of death are not the keys for the, a type two, right? Those are actually information. So we have two <coughs> other fields down there, the DW rec created date and the DW rec updated date. Maybe this is supposed to be a type two. Because why would you have an updated date if it was a, oh no, wait a minute, that would mean it was a type one. You're gonna override it. So now I'm really confused, clearly. I do not know what to do. So there's a CRC and a CRC adder, which was a standard we had. You all, most of you here are old enough to remember CRC, right? Yeah, so this is the change data capture key and the change data capture attribute which I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we did with that in my TED talk at, at noon today, so come back to hear that. Um, so if it's, that implies you're doing some change data capture. So again, maybe it's type one, but wait a minute, if you're doing change data capture, that sounds like type two, doesn't it? I don't know. The indexes don't tell us anything because the index does not include any of those metadata dates. If I saw patient ID plus say DW created date, 
I would think, okay, you know, maybe it's a type 2. The only way to know is to compare those two attributes. You've got to go do some data profiling, look at DW rec created date and DW rec updated date and see if they're different. If they're different, well then that means we got a type one and they're overriding the, ro the rows. If they're the same, well then whoever did this was an idiot and he didn't need the updated column, right? I, so I can't tell actually out doing additional work. All right, the date dimension. Every data warehouse has to have a date dimension, right? Date dimension standard. Uh, yeah. Don't even get me. I'll have to. If we have time, I'm going to go roam through the model a little bit. There were several date dimension tables. Not quite sure why, but anyway. So let's take a look at this one. What jumps up out at you as this, assuming it is supposed to be a standard date dimension? Um, all optional again. You see, you're sensing a pattern here. All optional. What else? Can hear you. Again, no primary key. Now, presumably, we can reasonably guess that a date dimension is not a type two, so we don't even have to have that conversation, right? The calendar doesn't change. Once we build a calendar dimension, we just add to it. We don't generally go back and change it. Oh, unless, of course, your company changes their fiscal year. And fiscal year is part of your date dimension. Are you going to overwrite that? Or are you going to turn your date dimension into a type 2 so you can show them analysis with the old fiscal year versus the new fiscal year when it's realigned? So that's, that's a little. We didn't have that. This was way more simple-minded than that. Let's see what else we got in here. Anything else? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, the again, the first column, DT concept code. Do you think DT maybe stands for date? Yeah, but it's a number. So maybe it's a surrogate key, but the suffix is code again. So that's another one of those weird things. So again, all optional. I'm assuming the first column is the primary key. Because I have, again, no clues, no indexes, no nothing. No primary key declared, no unique key, no indexes. Again, sensing a pattern. With all of those in place, of course, we could run the load multiple times and end up with the same date in our date dimension multiple times. This is kind of a problem. A question here. If you go back, did you previous to have number 19 on everything and here's plain numbers very good yeah you, you caught that huh yeah number 19 uh, on all the other on the other dimensions there the codes are number 19 and on the date dimension it's just number yeah. no explanation 36 yeah month name 36. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it must be another, yeah, long, they're longer in other countries. Uh, this is not a multinational database. This is, this is a U.S. healthcare metrics database. So, yeah, nice, nice try. I like that. That was a good thought. Bar chart 36. I had noticed that. Oh, and then the federal holidays one is a bar chart 34. And the MU date code is a bar chart 23. And the... Wow, so we get 36, 36, 34, 19. Yeah, again, I just wanted, this stuff makes me crazy. You know, this gets back to, uh, you know, a little bit of, you know, Moan's conversation yesterday, the thing we uh, talked about, you know, in the Finnish Oracle user group about the 1% uh, geniuses, 50% idiots. It looks to be true. All right, so so we've looked at that a little bit before I go into the rest of the rant here. I'll bring up the data model. Okay, so here's another. Let's zoom in here a little bit so you guys can see. Maybe there, there we go. So there we go again. Oh, this one. Hey, look at this. This one's got a. Uh, uh, this, oh, we looked at this one. This was the patient one. That's got a primary key. All right, here we go. 
Here's another one, the MU order fact active. So I guess as opposed to inactive, I think we, we had a view for both. You see the same kind of thing. Here's some uh, denormalized columns just like the other one we looked at. Here's an interesting one, order ID is a number 10. The order created date code is number. So what do you think that is? That's the foreign key to the date dimension we were just looking at. Again, that naming standard sort of throws you off. But the date dimension, it was called DT concept code for the, what we think is the primary key of the date dimension. Uh, so here it is, order date code, order effective date code, and we've got order status. So apparently we don't have a status dimension. We just are going to denormalize a big string into the fact table, which, you know, that'll help create performance, I'm sure. Save us a join. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah. This one has a couple indexes on it, though. Ooh, yeah. This is, this is one of my fun ones here. Let me see here. Let's see if we can get this to open up. Index. Yeah, look at this. We have an index with a hard-coded expression in it. Order type MU equals laboratory. Okay, I'm you know, not that good at some of this stuff in Oracle. What does that mean when you do that with an index? That's not a function-based index, is it? There's no function. Okay, good. I, I like the looks on your faces. <laughs> See, I didn't even report this stuff to, to management. I, I mean, the, the first part was enough. And I started looking at this and going, what does that mean? I, I, don't, I don't get this. Isn't that just a constant? Yeah, they put a constant in an index. Yeah. Probably a way to provide uniqueness. Maybe a way to provide uniqueness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. That's creative. Two points for that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me see what this looks like. I gotta, actually, I didn't even thought about this. Let me see what this look like in DDL. Here's the DDL. Oh, look at, yeah, there it is down here. Create index. So apparently Oracle will let you do this. It's a constant. Indexing null values in the prior column. Really? So it's kind of a function-based index. I, I honestly have never seen this construct before. So have any of you ever actually seen this? Yeah, but you put One? a zero or something. You put a zero or something. Yeah, well, wouldn't there be an NVL in there? Yeah. Or a case or a coalesce or something? No, no, you don't, no? You don't need that. It's just, it's just to index every row in the table, even when the real value is null. OK. It's just a trick so that you index Talks about it. Okay, so this guy must have read one of Tom's things because this seems to be the only thing he did that was like advanced. <laughs> well, good. You would put a zero in there. Yeah, why would you put laboratory in there? Because if you query the database, is it going to find the, ter the constant laboratory in the index and return a result? No, it's just going to if. Okay. No, it's a way to store not null values in there. It, not, it you cannot see where order type MU is null, it can still use the index to look things up. Right, so the laboratory term means absolutely nothing. Okay. Okay, that's, well, that's, that's good. I was a little confused here. I'm, so, kind of had the right idea, but didn't quite do it. All right, that's good. See, I, I knew I would learn something from this group. Yeah, I mean, seriously, this, this is a good group of people. That's why I wanted to bring it here and go on. I can't explain this when somebody asks me, it's like, what, what did they do that for? I, I don't know. All right, location dimension. Location code. Hey, look at that. That one, the primary key is actually mandatory. So we made progress on this one. Uh, there's an index on practice ID, which, by the way, is, I think, a foreign key to a practice dimension, though there's no foreign key here. So we do have a, a bit of a snowflake going on. Uh, site ID, though, should be the same thing. 
Yeah, some more. So it's got all our little ETL date created and updated dates. So again, I'm back to, is this a type one or a type two dimension? I don't know without actually going and, and looking into it because they haven't declared any indexes on that. Because if it's a type two dimension, you would want a unique constraint on the natural column plus the date, right? So you don't enter two values on the same date timestamp for the same thing, right? Again, kind of missing some stuff. The order, of the, the order of the columns are incorrect on this one. Yeah, but there was only 500 rows, so, you know, it's not really, it's a full table, it's not a big deal. Right. So you're saying we're going to have blockchain? Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I didn't even, I didn't even get to that. It's like, yeah. There is no foreign key at all. Is that a concern? And I don't say foreign key anyway. Yes, that's a huge concern that there's no foreign keys. You must have missed the first two, two minutes there. I said, Oracle kind of needs those to do some optimization. You can't do a star query join optimization here, right? Because there's no foreign keys. There's no, oh, by the way, did anybody see any bitmap indexes? No bitmap. Okay. okay. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, and then this one was really interesting where you've got all the metadata columns and then there are two other attributes at the end. Yeah, not quite sure why. And unfortunately, I was not allowed to talk to the person who designed this. I, Too embarrassed? I, you know, I, I think my management was, uh, I don't know, maybe afraid I'd piss them off or something. I, I don't know. How worse could it get? I mean, really, they gave us something that doesn't work. Um, and one of the things I found out is that it was, this was one of the uh, classic bait and switches, is the guy who was the senior guy that apparently people were impressed with was on this for about three hours over the course of a couple of months, right? So now I have worked, I uh, to say, the company who shall rename, remain nameless, I have worked with a couple of their people more recently, and they actually are good, so they do have some people who more or less know what they're doing, um, but nobody was overseeing this project at all. They just completely outsourced it, brought it in, and then tried to run it. Okay, now here's, remember I mentioned multiple date dimensions. Here's another date dimension, because that wasn't the name of the one I showed you before. Uh, again, primary key that's optional. Uh, then there's an index on there for start and end date, kind of interesting. And there is an index on the uh, concept code. What's the on that table? This one? Yeah. Let's look. That's a great question. I am so glad you asked that. So I was just thinking the same thing. How the heck did they do that? Ah, that's how. They just called it a PK. They created a unique index on the code, so that's how come it's optional. But no, it's marked as a T. It has a T down at the bottom. So how did... But if you say primary key, it uh, makes it not on those fields that have to be... Yeah, yeah, you can't declare a primary key on an optional field in Oracle. You don't you have to specify that. that. You don't have to do the opposite and do that. And then you can drop it, it goes back to not knowing. Ah. Well, an interesting way of doing things, that's for sure. So that's what it does, but yeah, everything's optional. Let me see, anything else interesting on here before I move on? Location dimension, okay, that one's got a mandatory primary key. Oh, there's that table date dimension standard. So again, we've got three date dimensions in this design so far, none of which have foreign keys to them two of which don't even have primary keys. So this is another one with no primary key. Looks very similar to the other one, but this is the standard one versus something else. I'm not sure what non-standard is, but. No, it's actually a table. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And there's some views in this, which again, I didn't even want to get into what some of the views look like, because that's, it gets really ugly. Uh, let's see here. Some more fact tables. This one is indexed. But again, everything's optional, no foreign keys. Few clues because we have some indexes. 
So at least I have an idea of how they think they were going to query it. So they were trying to do some performance tuning. Wait, where did you put the redundant indexes in What? There? Hang on. What? Where did they put the calculation in there? Where did they put the calculation? Yeah, like, uh, you know, the, the measurement. OK. It's supposed to be in the back table, right? Yeah, normally you have a calculator. Uh, see, there's a value there, but that's a bar char 1,000. <laughs> you, you don't think that's a calculation? Maybe they did a two star on it after they did the aggregation. So you have. I mean, I I am as clueless about this as you are, honestly. I, I just look at this, and again, this is why I thought it was like I've got to do a talk on this, and this is just this is too bad to not bring in front of people who know what they're doing. Um, and I'll rant about why in a minute. I think many of them, because this is a metrics database, everything, all the reporting on this are just counts. So in a couple of cases, they put a count column in the fact table. But you know, if you look at this one here, the visit fact active, there's not a count column. So they're doing it, I think, in a business objects report. Right, so it's a factless fact table. Just a bunch of codes. Comment about the indexes? Yes. There are redundant indexes. Redundant indexes. Can you, can, can you scroll back? Ooh, did you, you caught one. Overloaded, yeah. Okay, the last index. Re, re, the number four, yeah. yeah. Of the <coughs> it's got the first two columns are the same. Index. Yeah. And the first index, you don't need that one either. The last right. Very good. See, again, you guys are find, finding stuff that didn't jump out at me because I, I got sick looking at it after a while. So yeah, so he's pointing out this last index, which is provider code, patient code, and result type. Index one is provider code. We don't need it. Index four is provider code and patient code. We don't need it. Because they're in the same order in the fourth index. The fourth index there, well, I guess that's the fifth index, even though it's number index zero. INDX04. <laughs> so, that book I showed you at the beginning about data model design reviews? Yeah. I think I, I need to send them a copy, apparently. I'm sorry, I think you made this up. No. <laughs> you made it? It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. No, yeah, and that's why I had to say, yeah, this is real. Yeah, okay, good. You know, this is, it, this is good therapy for me. To know that I'm not, you know, just an insane moron trying to make things too hard, right? I'm trying to make data warehousing too difficult because I'm being so picky about this. And that letter that I wrote about the basic incompetence of the people who did this, um, you guys are helping me feel a lot better about myself right now. So that's, that's good. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Moans, for Oak Table. It's a good therapy session, even without the alcohol. Okay, so this is the last one we'll look at. Oh, here's that, yeah, one with order type MU equals laboratory, order type MU. Let's see, does this have any redundancy of the redundancy department here? Yeah. Order created code. Yeah. But again, another fact table, no primary keys, no foreign keys. Oh, this one's got an order count in it, so there's your measure column. <laughs> at least one. We got one. One with a measure column in it, all right? And the index names are funny. The index names are funny. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, so FCT versus FACT. Oh, yeah, that last one's really good, isn't it? It combines both, all of them together. IDX underscore 06. And we got IND05 and INDX05. I wonder what happened to one through four. <laughs> They're in another table, I think. <laughs> oh, and to make this even... Go to back to DW version number one. Okay, and just for fun, the, the reason I made a diagram for this one is because this was one of the things we were trying to figure out. Is this... <coughs> they have a, these three tables cross-joined in one of the views. Yeah, oh. <laughs> So yeah, those of you who've done this for a while, what do you do? If you've got fact tables at differing grains, 
and you cross join them, what happens? But is the gear order stage is now 259? Another way it was 1,000. Yeah, so the, yeah, the columns are, don't even align <laughs> as far as the data types and sizes. Yes, that, that's true. But they're pretty much guaranteeing a Cartesian product here, or partial Cartesian product, because there are actual join columns. But these are, each of these tables has a different number of dimensions, which means the, the tables are a different level of granularity. But they wanted it all apparently in one report. So I'm not sure how they're doing the dedupe. Oh, but there's that MU type yep, yep. equals laboratory. They only want the rows that are laboratory, which is the value that was hard coded into the index. Right? Okay. I'm glad that I could bring some entertainment to Oak Table World this year. The comedy show that this little thing is. Let's see. What else do I got here for you? Okay. All right. So other things, just to continue. The partitioning scheme had never been tested. The target table was partitioned and sub-partitioned in a very non-standard way. There was not a date field in the partition anywhere. They pre-created the target table with 200 partitions. And it was a list-based partition on an attribute that only has 37 values. <laughs> and this is what the DBA said. This is why we ran out of temp space, because we were trying to load in parallel 200 partitions. Except that there's only 37 values in that, that are actually valid in the list partition. So this was one of those, what did you? And again, this, this is a healthcare database. It is metrics mandated by the US government. Those metrics are pretty much cast in stone. There's 37 of them. There's not 200. So maybe you would think, ah, uh, the Congress is gonna do something in the next year. We'll add a couple extra just in case. And of course, the metrics are, have codes, one through 37. Just say, and of course, no partition aware loading at all. <coughs> partition swapping, none of that was going on. They were just doing, again, it was insert into, select star from, and actually in the subquery, there was actually a select distinct, which causes Oracle to do what? Pull all the data up, all 500 million rows, sort it, and then try to pull it out and do the insert, and the one of the views even had a hint in it. It was hard-coded to parallel eight, just for good measure, I guess. No indexes on the partitions or sub-partitions, because you saw how many indexes there were. None of those columns were the partition columns at all. You select star from source on a view. It was in a view, yeah. They had an upper function in the predicate that when I looked at the data, well, of course, yes. So if there was an index, it wouldn't have worked. But as it turned out, when I looked at the data, it was all uppercase. Already, they didn't need to do an upper. The degree of parallelism hard-coded into the view. <coughs> they had dummy columns in the view. To tr they were thinking they were gonna do some sort of union all thing. And so they had like 10 <laughs> null dummy columns to align it with something, and I still haven't figured out why. And of course, there was no documentation, and this part of it was never tested, because when they did the POC, there were no partitions, right? It was 500 rows. They just had the original table, and then after they delivered the POC, and everybody said, yes, this is exactly what they need, they apparently then went back and rewrote the table definitions to include the 200 partitions, and the views to include the hard-coded stuff and it was never tested with real data. So, this is my other thing, the fallacy of the unconstrained data warehouse. How many of you have worked with ETL programmers that say they don't want any constraints on the data warehouse, right? All of them, yes. <laughs> All of them, unless they've been beaten up by some of us. Um, and they say why? Because it slows down the load, right? That's the rationale, fast to load, no constraints, and all the validation is in the code. Well, of course, in this case, it was all SQL. There was no validation. It wasn't PL SQL, mind you. It was SQL. Insert into select from. All right? So the reality of this is that you 
may get a very low, very fast load, but then your queries aren't going to be great because you haven't tuned it for extract at all. Um, and let's even forget about the fact there's no primary keys and we could run the load three times and get three sets of rows that are exactly the same, but that's a different problem. The code may not have been QA'd well, and I'm being generous. <laughs> yeah, no model to tell the programmers what the rules are. So how are you guaranteeing me that all the validations in the code, if the underlying model doesn't give you any hints on what the rules should be? What columns are required? What foreign keys should we be checking? What defines a duplicate row? Especially when you only tested it with 500 rows, right? How can you do that? And one of the things I've learned from my uh, QA folks that work with me is they do like this stuff because they can go back, even if you put the foreign keys into the database and make them disabled, I told them, after you run the load, I want you to go alter, constraint, enable. If any of them fail, the code fails. There's something wrong with the load, right? They should all be able to enable just fine. If they can't, something's wrong. So the cost to the organization of this is slow query response, bad data loaded, and almost no clues to help tune it when they complain that it doesn't work. They got their money's worth. All right, the moral of the story, be careful who you outsource to. They may be part of that 50% idiots. Have someone independent of the outsourcing agency, either an outside consultant or an internal senior person. Have them do touch point reviews of the design throughout the project. Don't just wait till the end deliverable and then see what comes out. It will cost you a little extra, but it could save you months. In this case, it has been, it was like three months at least before they finally got the load to work because a couple of weeks of back and forth with the vendor, getting them to agree to send somebody to try to fix it. Um, I did, as soon as this happened, my first response was, we need to call Tim Gorman. And literally, I sent an email, it's like, we need to call Tim, bring him in, three days. Three days, he'll have this fixed. Nope. <laughs> we gotta debate it, we gotta talk about it. We gotta figure out what we should do. And by the time I actually sent an email to Tim, he was working for Delphix anyway, so he could Insist on documentation. Insist on knowledge transfer with your internal DBAs and require load testing with performance criteria. You're gonna outsource a data mart or a data warehouse. This is just insane. Trust but verify, right? I actually wouldn't even trust them, so. <laughs> Clearly, like I said, this is not made up. This is real. All right, yeah, we've got like, it's time to take a break. Um, you guys have been great. Odie Tug, Florida, next June, on the beach. Submit abstracts, they're due the 15th of this month, so there's still time to get in. I encourage you all to do stories like this, right? Our organizations are never going to come to the realization that they need to be more careful about what they do and who they hire and educating people, sending them to conferences like this, unless we start pointing out to each other at least some of the bad practices we've seen. Because part of the issue in my mind is most people are afraid to speak up and say, this is stupid, right? The people in this room, we got ACEs, ACE directors, Oak Table members, ACE wannabes. You know, we're the ones that have to make a difference in the community, right? And with our clients. I look at it this way, they, they're paying me for my expertise. And they don't have to take my advice, but they do pretty much have to listen at least. And when I'm willing to put it in writing like I did at the beginning, they do tend to pay a little bit of attention. Uh, I don't know if it'll make any change in the organization that this happened with, but maybe it will. Hopefully this will give you guys some uh, fodder to go back to your organizations and make people think about it, or because you're all working for them, you can make them appreciate what they've got because they didn't get this, right? So thank you all for, for coming this morning. <laughs>
Thank you, Pupil. Thanks for the education on the, uh, the index thing. I didn't know that, so that was helpful. And you guys found a couple of errors that I hadn't seen before, so next time I do this presentation, I can add to the list. All right, I believe it is coffee break time. <laughs>